Welcome to this distinguished lecture series of Shaping Engineering Aspirations, a timely initiative by Muthoot Institute of Technology and Science, Cochin, to inspire and engage young engineering aspirants and budding engineers during this time of COVID pandemic break and lockdown. Muthoot Institute of Technology and Science strongly believes that this is quality time to be utilized constructively to ideate, be creative and stay organized. Hence, this distinguished lecture series, which include perspectives of industry experts and international and pan-Indian business leaders. The first lecture is by Mr. Vinod Tharagan, a computer engineer by profession and is a self-driven and passionate entrepreneur has widely traveled and successfully established his brand name places primarily associated and doing business with US clients like JP Morgan Deloitte Wells Fargo and Amazon to name a few currently he is into diversified business foraying into reinventing infrastructure through cutting-edge technology providing intelligent and trendy solutions for building new spaces and personalized lifestyle houses. He already has, to his credit, two completed projects at Kakanad. These are practical lessons for engineering students on interdisciplinary learning and operating initiatives. Mr. Vinod Tharagan has a very clear and coherent message for all aspiring and budding engineers about the importance and urgency of skill development that's going to shape and equip these students with exponential futuristic job opportunities in engineering. Welcome to the session on uh, shaping engineering aspirations where I get an opportunity to share my perspectives. Um, firstly, just a quick introduction on what we do. Uh, so Clasis was founded in 2009 as an IT product company here in Cochin, uh, in Infopark actually. And uh, we've got offices in the US uh, as well, uh, but uh, most of our operations are run out of India. Uh, we diversified into construction and real estate in 2016, and I'll be explaining more about how we got into all of that and what we're doing there. Uh, and then we also expanded into infrastructure and commercial real estate in 2018. Uh, today, we have about 275 employees. Um, uh, we have existed to create a leading edge intellectual property with our software products. And I'm going to touch a little more about that later on in the presentation. Uh, and uh, again, outside of software, which is our core, uh, it's interesting that we diversified into construction. And I think uh, we've, we've literally reinvented construction technology in India today. Uh, it's a very tall plane, but I should be able to share some information in this presentation. Uh, again, everything about the company is uh, around employee-centric growth to ensure that we have put in place very innovative benefits to allow uh, our staff to stay with us for the long term. Uh, so that's a quick background about what we do as a group of companies. Um, quick background about uh, myself. Uh, so. I'm a computer engineer, graduated out uh, of Go Engineering College, uh, class of 91. I uh, was fortunate enough to work uh, around the world, uh, in the US, in Europe, and uh, uh, finally in the Middle East before I moved back to Cochin in 2007 and then uh, set up my company. Uh, I, I currently lead uh, our uh, the Traces group, uh, both in on the technology side and on the infrastructure side as well. Uh, again, uh, just want to give you some background here as I get into the depth of what I'm going to cover uh, today. Uh, we've got customers uh, in the Fortune 500 space, uh, primarily in the United States. Uh, so a lot of the technologies we've created, uh, we've seen very good adoption. Uh, and I'll relate back to this as I continue in the presentation. So my key message today is uh, to try and kind of express uh, uh, one of these thoughts that's been in my mind for quite a while, which is if kids nearing their 20s today could understand and learn uh, from people my age who are in their mid 40s, 
which I truly believe they can, then they will change the world and make it exponentially better. So this is my belief. And I'm going to take this opportunity to try and communicate that as effectively as I can in this presentation. So now, uh, you know, the whole question is about uh, starting your careers. And, and I think this is a fascinating time of change. And, and let me tell you why. Uh, so what we're going through today is literally called the fourth industrial revolution. As all of you know, the first industrial revolution was all about steam. Uh, and then we transitioned to the second industrial revolution, which was driven by electricity and the automobile. It's sort of you know, horses and animal driven carriages. We had like automobiles with the internal combustion engine and such. The third industrial revolution, which was not so long ago, it was in the practically in the 90s, right? Um, was about computing and the internet. And that was huge. Uh, all of you are experiencing the impact of that. And today we are in what is called the fourth industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution is about automation, uh, autonomy, and AI. And this is a huge shift that brings up huge opportunities that I'm going to touch on. Um, now, very interesting perspective shared by David Rose, and he's one of uh, the very big investors based out of New York. And he's, he said this, which I think makes a ton of sense, which is any company designed for success in the 20th century is doomed to fail in the 21st century. So what that means is there's so much of things have changed, right? So much about how we do our jobs and how uh, the world works has changed, that the skills you acquired to to work in the 20th century are not the skills required to work in the 21st century. And, and, and that's, again, a key perspective I'm going to share in, in this session. Uh, so I just want to kind of uh, establish that background. Um, one of the key points I want to express today is this concept of linear versus exponential change. And I want to start with this because uh, it will allow you to understand to some extent what's going on, right? So linear change is incremental change. So for example, if you're taking a step and one step is one meter, you can predict where you are in five steps or 10 steps or 30 steps. So 30 steps is 30 meters, right? Uh, so that's linear change. Uh, exponential change, on the other hand, is uh, where in every cycle or every step of that change, uh, there is a doubling effect or a near doubling or tripling effect in some cases. And this is uh, where you end up with an exponential curve. So it's not just one, two, three now. It's one becoming two, two becoming four, four becoming eight, so on and so forth. And what you realize is very quickly, 30 steps of exponential change gets you past a billion meters, right? So it's very hard to wrap your head around that. But uh, a lot of what is happening today is being driven by exponential change. So it's just, I just want to start by uh, setting the difference between linear and exponential change. Uh, so what we are witnessing today is uh, uh, technological advances across time. So if you look at the last three, 4,000 years, right? Uh, not a lot changed uh, till we got to the, the last 100 years, maybe a hundred and couple of hundred years, right? Uh, in the last 100 years, the change uh, driven by technology has been huge, and, and the progress in the world has been exponential, right? And, and by exponential, you can see what the curve is, right? If you plot it statistically, it was very slow, and then it took off, and then it's almost going vertical now. And we are headed towards AI autonomy and automation, uh, now, it's very difficult to predict exactly when we're going to be confronted with that situation, but it's happening right now, right? Uh, and that's important to understand uh, how this is going on uh, to relate uh, to the best way to plan your future. Again, I wanted to share some data points. So uh, if you look at the major U.S. company valuations in 2006, this is the, the value of these big U.S. brands, right, in 2006. They were big companies with massive valuations. Uh, now, if you look at the same data for these companies, 10 years uh, hence, in 2016, you can see there's a huge shift, right? Their valuations have dropped dramatically, uh, and it's all being driven by, uh, you know, in fact, a lot of them are losing uh, market share to, to uh, other big uh, uh, companies like Amazon, right, which is growing exponentially, and the others are losing. Uh, so. Uh, it's happening very quickly, and, and this is from 2016, which is 10 years. Uh, and if you look at the data from 2019, it's continuing to happen, right? So this is a massive disruptive change that's happening across uh, these major industries. 
<clears throat> so the question is, why is this happening and why is it happening now, right? What's driving this, this kind of disruptive change? Um, and, and the key perspective there is that this kind of disruptive change is being driven by the exponential growth of technologies and tools. That's what's driving this change. Uh, so what I wanted to share objectively is uh, this concept of dematerialization. So dematerialization is a concept where uh, if you look at this uh, slide, uh, you used to have a room full of equipment uh, to fulfill the uh, requirements you had for all kinds of things that have all collapsed into this form factor of the smartphone today, right? So this concept of dematerialization, which is physical products and services are now collapsing into a digital experience in a smartphone is, is what's going on objectively. Uh, the, so the first step with a lot of uh, traditional incumbent products and services is this concept of dematerialization. The next step is this concept of demonetization so you can already see the disruption that's happening uh, for example a year a few examples like a taxi fleet is being disrupted by a model like uber or amazon what they did to bookstores to start with and now, now what they're doing to retail in general uh, skype for long distance telecommunications google for search craigslist is like olx and quicker in india uh, classifies was a huge revenue generating option for newspapers and that's been cannibalized by you uh, know or taken over by options like craigslist or in india it's quicker than olx and airbnb has been huge in terms of disrupting the hospitality industry uh, with hotel chains right so demonetization is where the price is dropping uh, rapidly uh, and the quality of the service is improving actually and uh, that's what we are witnessing right now the third step is democratization. And in this particular step, objectively, what's happening is once you have these products and services get digitized and then demonetized, democratization means everybody has access to it. So you could be, uh, you know, uh, in, in Africa, you could be a third world country, you could be a citizen down there. But with access to a smartphone and connectivity to the Internet today, uh, that gentleman you see on the screen has uh, access to more information than the president of the United States had just 25 years ago, right? Which is very hard to uh, kind of relate to. Uh, not only does he have access to more information than the U.S. president had 25 years ago, but he has access to the same information that Larry Page, for example, who's the chairman of Alphabet and the founder of Google, has today. Right, so democratization means everybody now has access to these capabilities. Uh, so what is actually driving this change? So what's driving this change is the exponential growth in computing power. So just to wrap your head around what's going on, uh, by 2023, based on the current exponential curve of computing power, uh, a laptop or a smartphone will have the computing power of a human being by 2023. And a couple of decades later, by 2050, based on the current growth chart, just a smartphone or laptop would have the computing capacity of the entire human race. And that is this concept of exponential change, which is very difficult to wrap your head around. So it's almost difficult today to imagine the kind of applications that are going to exist uh, in the future. Uh, but it's very easy to predict this growth curve based on the advances in computing power that we have been witnessing and we're going to continue to witness in the coming uh, uh, decades. So with coming back to the key focus of this whole presentation, right? Why should all this matter to me? So I'm, I'm a 12th standard student um, thinking about my career, I'm trying to figure out what I need to do. Why should all this matter to me? I think firstly, it's important to understand what is going on. And then secondly, it's important that you focus on acquiring skills. Uh, and acquiring skills means uh, you want to focus on actually picking up skills that allow you to get stuff done versus just certifications, right? So certifications and qualifications are important, but your focus needs to be on skill acquisition. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. And then you want to focus on learning versus studying, right? So what this means is, uh, studying something is to get good marks in an examination. Now, that is important, but learning the subject and connecting the dots on what is the relevance of the subject is, is actually more important when you think about a career. 
and then the focus on getting good at what you do right it's not just uh, in this day and age it's not about just learning something and you're uh, you can do an acceptable job right how do you get really good at it is important and then uh, you know how do you build your profile so you see so no longer recruitment happens based on you know which university you graduated from and such uh, most of the recruitment today at least for experienced people is happening through tools like linkedin where you you have an opportunity to broadcast your profile and your capabilities and your competencies and companies are looking at tools like that to find you versus oh anybody who's graduated from iit is the best at something that is obviously not the case right uh, and so the exponential opportunity ahead of you is uh, is again um, one of the reasons that this is important to relate to uh, the key thing to understand is almost everything around you today is suboptimal and it can be made much better right so if you really don't focus you're thinking oh my god everything is uh, you know already created and already invented what am i going to do what is my focus uh, if i learn to be an engineer you know where am i going to apply my skills but that's not true almost everything around you is suboptimal and what that means is it can be way better than it is today uh, and again you know with, with the changes that are happening in the world today we are moving from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance so what this means is um, you know gdp in a country is measured by uh, you know products and services and for the creation of any product or service you need uh, labor and you need energy right and both of these are, are almost going to zero so energy is going to zero because of renewables like solar and others uh, and the prices are crashing uh, so it's when i'm saying going to zero it's like the cost of telecom communications today is zero right it used to cost a lot to make an international telephone call today you don't even think about it it's practically free similarly labor's through automation is also becoming free okay so with energy and labor becoming free we can pretty much produce anything we want and and that's why we are transitioning to a world of abundance uh, and we exist today in a global village so if you have expertise in a very narrow space uh, you know you can collaborate with anybody in the world who shares the same interests which is amazing right that that capability exists today uh, it's literally a global village so you can collaborate with anybody else in the world to ensure that you're functioning at a world class standard uh, and the innovation opportunity i think uh, so we talk about everything being suboptimal the innovation opportunity is huge if you start applying the right techniques to figure out how can you apply your skills and your knowledge to truly innovate and improve how a lot of the products and services out around us exist today so then the key question is how do you do this right all well and good but how do you do this and that's important because how do i grow my skills right that's a question that each of you would have how do i get good at anything you choose to do right that's again an important question you know what's the pathway how do you do it how do i succeed in growing my career all of you have these questions right and finally how do you stay happy during the journey it's not just about working hard and you know making money you know you want to maintain a happy state of mind right so so these are the key questions and how do you address them so firstly let's talk about how how you can grow your skills right so uh, in terms of growing your skills i think uh, it's an interesting perspective i want to share here about focusing on what versus how okay uh, so what i mean here is Uh, I'll just bring up this Albert Einstein quote. You know, uh, what Einstein said is that if you have one hour to solve a problem, uh, you're probably better off spending 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. Okay, so this is a very interesting perspective. That you know, it's more important to understand what is the problem and what are you trying to achieve and focus on that and think about that. And it's less important to to uh, you know. spend time on thinking about the solutions because the more you understand the problem the, the solutions will naturally evolve in your mind all right so that's an important point there and again i'm just zooming out to kind of express it in terms of what versus how uh the other key thing here which kind of goes against the <laughs> the standard educational approach that exists today which is again an uh, einstein quote about never memorizing something that you can look up right so uh if you look at how our educational system works today it's all about what can you memorize and which textbook do you need to study from and such and it's less about uh, 
clear understanding of the subject and applying your subject matter expertise to solving problems. Um, so, you know, it's very important to understand that memorizing things is relevant in academia and scoring marks in examinations. In the real world, nobody cares. People just want you to solve problems and you can refer to as much information or knowledge as you would like to help you with that, uh, that whole requirement, right? So these are, again, perspectives I'm sharing in relation to what versus how. Uh, now, you need to study hard and get the right marks to build your career, but that's not what is going to help you uh, in, in your uh, career once you start working. So the key question, again, is uh, should I go to engineering college, right? Uh, I think yes, because unless you have a clear direction on other uh, areas of interest, uh, engineering is a great foundation and great environment to learn because now you're working with uh, or you're learning with other peers and other students where, which helps you collaborate and bounce ideas and, and you know, learn through that community kind of uh, uh, situa situation versus just uh, trying to learn something on your own. So I think it's uh, going to engineering college is great. Um, now, again, should you try to get into the IITs? Uh, you know, I I'm not so sure, right? But there's no harm in trying. Uh, I don't think it's going to make a big difference to your career today because it's all about, uh, like I said, it's all about your skills versus where you graduated from. So as long as you get into a, a good college uh, that gives you uh, exposure to the right uh, knowledge and uh, the right tools uh, to kind of learn what you need to, to kind of gain expertise in a particular subject, you should be fine. Um, so then the next question is, how do you get good at what you choose to do, right? Uh, so I want to introduce this concept of reasoning by first principles. So there are two ways to solve any problem. The, the default way that all of us use to solve any problem is called reasoning by analogy. And reasoning by analogy is to look at how everybody else is solving that problem, whatever it is, right? So you look at how everybody else does something, and then you relate to that, and you might try to incrementally improve up about that, but that's how all of us solve problems by default. Reasoning by first principles is very different, right? Reasoning by first principles is all about uh, going down to the basic foundational truths around a problem. So again, the first principle is, is a basic assumption that cannot be deduced any further. So it is a foundational truth that nobody can dispute, right? And again, uh, first principles is a fancy way of thinking like a scientist. So what that means is, uh, you start from what you know is absolutely true, right? Or what can be proven to be true. And then you work your way up to potential solutions from that layer. And what you will end up finding is you will find a lot of innovations that have happened in the last century, maybe, uh, and in the last few decades that will help you improve upon each layer of this, the solutions that you will look for. And you'll end up with a final solution that is exponentially better than anything that exists. So first principles is a very powerful way that has helped us a lot, and we're going to touch on that. Again, a couple of quotes uh, from Elon Musk at, at this time, uh, where he says, when you're trying to acquire knowledge, right, think of knowledge as a semantic tree, or think of it like a tree. Uh, and before you get into the details, which are the leaves, you want to make sure you have a good understanding of the key trunk of the tree and the key branches of knowledge. Uh, which is very easy to acquire. But once you understand that, which is kind of like the what of any subject, right? Then the how, which is all the details, uh, are relevant when you need to focus on how. But as long as you understand the core trunk of knowledge and the core branches of knowledge, you'll be able to apply that knowledge as potential tools to solve certain problems. The next quote he had uh, really helped us a lot, helped me a lot, actually, which is, uh, he says that for any person who's trying to explain any complex problem, right, uh, if they cannot explain it at a level that a 10-year-old can understand, then they probably don't know what they're talking about. So he's very blunt about certain things, uh, if you listen to what he says and a lot of his talks. But this is very relevant, it was very relevant to me, because when I'm trying to gain new knowledge, I always struggle because I feel I'm dumb. You know, I'm listening to somebody explain it and I'm not getting it. Now I just skip through videos on YouTube till I find somebody who can explain it at a level I can understand, which again is that foundational tree and the key branches, which is easy to understand. And, and that's what I need as a starting point, right? And then I can get to the details, which are the leaves at a, at a future stage once I want to apply that knowledge. 
So again, uh, some uh, information that might help you connect the dots. Uh, so then the question is, how do I succeed and grow in my career? Okay, how do you go about doing this? Uh, I think the key thing from our experience is uh, you have to focus on sharpening your communication skills, especially in English, right? So English communications is critical. Uh, and a lack of decent communication skills, I think, is the number one issue we face when interviewing candidate jobs. English is, is today it's the language of business for the world. So getting good in, in the English language is what is really going to help you cement your abilities and grow faster. So I, I would really, you know, say focus on, on picking up your communication skills. Uh, and then it's also very important to pick up people skills and understand basic psychology. Uh, so what I mean here is uh, people skills, okay, I mean, I would highly recommend this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. The book was written in the 1930s, but it is so relevant even today. It, it just talks about how people are and how people behave and what's the best way to go about dealing with people or interacting with people. Great book, highly recommend it. Uh, the other thing about the psychological aspects of, of uh, supporting your career, I would say, again, understand what is ego pride jealousy envy empathy and and recognize each of them at play in your mind right uh, because it will also help you understand and deal with organizational politics uh, at work once you graduate or come out of school and, and start working uh, it's important to understand these psychological elements because if you really start uh, looking around you will see these are the key reasons that people take the wrong decisions professionally as well as personally in their lives right so it's important to kind of build a foundation of basic psychology and just understanding these things it's not easy to control these psychological elements in your mind but at least you recognize why you're thinking a certain way and that's going to be a good guideline for you uh, and then finally you know how do you stay happy during this this journey so uh, again uh, by understanding what you're going to see that the how becomes very interesting. Uh, so what we mean here is you will see that once you understand what you're trying to do really well, then learning how to do it becomes very interesting and you will really enjoy the journey. Uh, also, working on meaningful problems using a first principles approach will give you a purpose in life and the journey itself will thrill you the most. Again, what happens is when you start applying first principles, you're going to see opportunities to come up with world beating solutions. And I'm going to give you a few examples about what we're doing at places, for example, so you can kind of uh, relate to what I mean here. And uh, uh, and then I think it's important to also be patient as you grow your skills, because it typically takes two to three years in any job or subject to really establish yourself. So be patient, you know, don't, don't, don't worry if you're taking time to pick something up, because it takes a little time. It's like riding a bicycle. It's very difficult when you start learning, but the moment you learn it, then it's very easy. Uh, then you want to align your interests and avoid leaning towards what others want. I think this is, again, just um, a perspective I want to share because you see a lot of people trying to please others and they're unhappy, right? Uh, it's good to listen to advice, but navigate your way based on your own interests, and you don't need to get swayed by the expectations of others, you know, because if you follow your own interests, you're going to enjoy it, right? Because it's what you want to do, you understand it, and then you're working on certain things, you're going to enjoy it more. Uh, of course, when you start a family, uh, things will change a little bit. Uh, your interests should generally adjust and align with that of your family responsibilities and commitments. So this is something that's very early in your lives, but uh, as you grow, you're going to see that things are going to change once you uh, build out your personal family life as well. Uh, so I want to come back now to places, right? I've given you some background there and some shared some perspectives. So let me come back to places now and try and make this real. So I'm going to talk about what does places technologies do, which is our software company. So in the software company, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this concept of no code application development, but you can look it up on Google or something. But this is a, a next gen approach to building uh, applications or business software. Uh, we have a product called places app forms. Traditionally, you build a uh, web application using programming languages like C Sharp, PHP, Java, etc. Uh, now in no code, it's a different approach. Uh, it's uh, faster, better, lower cost, and more secure to build applications using a no code architecture. And we have a product in this space. Uh, no code also lets you build future proof business applications. And what that means is 
typically with uh, when you get into the details of software applications maintaining it is very expensive uh, takes a significant amount of time and such uh, but a no-code architecture allows you to build a feature-proof application. It's kind of like Excel, where you know upgrading to the latest version doesn't break what you've already created. So, for example, if you find a very old Excel spreadsheet, it continues to work in the latest version of Excel. Uh, and then finally, you need a, a significantly lower skill set to build functionality using no-code. So that's one core product that Glaciers has. Uh, so we, are, we also have a product in the robotic process automation space, and RPA is, for all practical purposes, a, a software robot, and you can look this up as well. And we have a product called Places RPA Genie, uh, which is a, a, a software robot that we have created. Again, RPA lets you automate mundane data entry tasks using a software robot, uh, and it allows you to integrate systems that were not designed to work together. So again, this is the automation side of things. And by freeing up people from mundane repetitive tasks, people can add more value where it matters. So since RPA robots work 24 by 7 with no breaks, productivity is significantly enhanced by lowering costs. And the third space that we exist in on the software side is artificial intelligence with machine learning and deep learning. Uh, we have a platform called Faces A1, uh, AI1 Genie. Uh, so what we do here is artificial intelligence, firstly, is a prediction engine. Uh, it uses information and data that you have to predict information and data that you don't have. Uh, we have used the key AI algorithms that exist to create industry solutions for financial institutions and digital security. We use AI for credit checking and fraud detection in banks and credit unions, uh, and also for deploying chatbots, which are like AI assistants. Uh, you can... Uh, literally chat with the chatbot and get answers just like you're talking, chatting with a human being. Uh, we also use AI for biometric authentication of a user using both their voice signature and face recognition. All of our investments into the future are with AI. So that's, again, a um, uh, space that we spend a lot of time in at Places. So this is what the software company does. Uh, I'll quickly touch on what Places Lifestyle, which is our construction company, what, what, what it does, right? So we construct next-gen homes and office buildings. That's what we do, right? That's what a construction company does. But what's different about what we do here is all our buildings are air-conditioned and built with R20 heat insulation for the floor, the ceilings, and the walls. Again, you know, I, I, I don't have the time to get into the details, but I'll just tell you exactly what this is. So our buildings are constructed with next-gen structural designs as well to lower costs and improve efficiency. All our buildings have building or home automation built into them so you can control any function from your smartphone, okay? Our projects are designed to be sustainable with captive solar power plants and off-grid power utilization, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, the benefits of R20 insulation are, in our case, for example, we are able to cool a 1,700 square foot apartment with a single 2.2 ton air conditioning system, right? So that's huge because, uh, you know, that's not the norm in India. Uh, and air conditioning the apartment at 25 degrees, for example, if you want to maintain that temperature 24 by 7, so it's running 24 hours um, for an entire month, uh, it consumes about 10 units of electricity a day, uh, which kind of translates to an approximate monthly cost of 2,500, which is exponentially lower than what it would be if you kind of air conditioned a, an apartment like this without uh, insulation. Again, for the insulation, we use styrofoam thermocol for the partition walls and the slabs. It also reduces the weight of the building by more than 50%, which is huge when you think about the foundation and the cost of all the other elements in the, in the building. 70% uh, of energy utilization, as you know, is for air conditioning. And if you think about how much money you spend at home to, 70% uh, is for air conditioning. And 70% of your air conditioning costs can be reduced if you use insulation. So right, that's, again, just a key data point. Um, again, applying first principles thinking to structural and aesthetic building design, uh, it's ended up in a 50% reduction in weight of the building, allowing us to optimize the foundation and the seismic resistance for the building. Innovating in construction techniques significantly lower construction labor costs and improve quality as well. Uh, and then integrating IoT, right, Internet of Things, into the building just allows us for optimal monitoring, convenience, and energy efficiency gain. So you can control pretty much everything from your smartphone. Utilizing modern materials and tools and applying them practically exponentially improves the end product as well. So give you a practical feel about the construction. So our expertise is software, right? But applying everything I touched on in my presentation to construction, which we were new to, 
allowed us to innovate, truly innovate here. So, for example, that's our residential building. Um, it's uh, you know it's all centrally air conditioned apartments with insulation built into it. Uh, again, all our partition walls are built using uh, in insulation materials like styrofoam or thermocol, as it's called. Uh, even our slabs, we use uh, uh, a lot of uh, insulation materials uh, just to give you a visual feel of it. And then uh, this was, for example, our office building that we just completed in Infopark. Uh, again, uh, you know, we end up with a solution with, which is lower cost with insulation. And in, in this particular case, we were able to reduce the weight of the building by 70%, which is huge. And that's the structure of the building. This is the finished building that we just occupied in December 2019. Uh, it actually is, as, as far as we know, the first building, I think, in India where we've used solar panels for the facade of the building. So what you see there, uh, some of it is glass, but most of it is solar panels. Uh, so we're generating about 30% of the energy needs of this building. Um, and uh, again, that's just a visual of, of the building right now. Again, I talked about uh, IoT and home automation, building automation. So you can pretty much control everything in the building using your smartphone. Uh, again, to share some data points, you know, if you talk to a air conditioning consultant in, in India or in Cochin, you know, they'll tell you you need one ton of air conditioning for 120 square feet of space. Uh, but if you really, you know, apply uh, insulation and such to your design, uh, it can be very different. You can have a much more efficient air conditioning for a residential or an office building. I'm just sharing some numbers here, which is the uh, calculation of tonnage in the United States. And, and it's so obvious, it's so clear that it's amazing that nobody looks at things like this in India. Uh, so again, coming back to, you know, I'm sorry I'm going very quickly, but I'm trying to cover the content that I wanted to share. So coming back to where we started, you know, uh, everything around you is going to change uh, with this fourth industrial revolution. And that is a huge opportunity ahead of you. Uh, I wish you all the best if you choose to opt for careers that align with uh, benefiting from this fourth industrial revolution okay uh, lastly uh, i've been asked to share my perspectives on on certain key questions that are relevant today uh, so let me try to do that firstly uh, again it's uh, interesting times with this covid 19 why the situation right and how is it going to impact things um, i think uh, what's been interesting for us is in industries like technology or it uh, working from home has worked out just fine. You know, I think the bigger impact is going to be for industries like the travel and hospitality industry that has been severely impacted. I don't think they're going to recover for a year or two at least. So that's what I feel there. Uh, again, with regards to automation and AI uh, across all multiple industries, uh, my perspective there is what a huge opportunity for all you guys and girls, right? I mean, the nature of jobs itself is changing and going to change dramatically. Uh, that, you know, somebody with 25 years experience uh, is starting from zero with you when it comes to AI and automation. So uh, you have a good advantage if you really get started now. Uh, again, you know, what's going to change uh, is the manual labor or repetitive tasks kind of jobs are going away and it's all going to be about creativity lifestyle oriented jobs uh what's the sort of disruption that i foresee uh post covid so i would say i think from what we are seeing work from home is going to become the norm for many industries not just technology or it which we are in uh, because it seems to work really well practically and in some cases can be more productive uh and and i think digital transformation you know which is uh, like what we're doing right now we are ordering groceries online which we were not doing here in Cochin or we are, uh, you know, uh, the telehealth where you're having a, a kind of a video conferencing session with your doctor versus going to a hospital and meeting the doctor, right? So there's gonna be a lot of disruption, I think, in yeah, a lot of areas post uh, this COVID situation. Uh, again, this is an interesting question. You know, it's surprising to me that the number of students opting for engineering are going down. I think it's probably because of a lack of clarity in communication of what the opportunities in this industry are. Uh, to be honest, uh, because my feel is uh, it's about the syllabus and how the teaching methodology exists today where uh, there needs to be significant change. Um, I think uh, 
you know, it's going to be a great future for anybody opting for engineering quite some time in their careers. And uh, again, you know, it's going to be a very good foundation for most of the jobs that are going to be evolving in the future. Um, I would say, you know, uh, focus more on, I think, you know, it's, it's a big discussion to talk about, uh, you know, the curriculum and the syllabus and, and teaching methodology, but those are my high level thoughts. And then lastly, you know, uh, strengths and weaknesses for uh, engineering graduates. So I would say in terms of the strengths, uh, I find uh, our Indian engineering graduates are very hardworking, they're committed, they're very good follow, right? You give them clear instructions on what they need to do, they're very good at that. Uh, the weaknesses, I would say, is more along the lines of uh, communication skills as a big one that I touched on. Uh, also a lack of confidence, I would say, uh, which is probably a cultural thing. That changes once they master the subject, but they come in with a lack of confidence. And then I would say, lastly, leadership skills, right? Uh, again, it's probably uh, you know related to the confidence uh, aspect as well. So that's what I feel are the weaknesses. But I think those are all huge opportunities, right, for all of you to kind of understand and, and get really good at or better at than, than what we've already seen. Uh, so that's it, you know. Uh, uh, I've tried to kind of express uh, my perspectives. Uh, sorry, I've gone a little fast here, but I wanted to cover as much subject matter as I could. Uh, so I wish you all the best and uh, thank you very much.